Okay, thanks for everyone for attending. I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, the guys on the top table here. First of all, we have Neil Black, the British Athletics Performance Director, who led both the Olympic and Paralympic programs to win more, more medals in Rio than were won in London 2012. Then we have Ailey Doyle. Ailey's our team captain for the IAAF World Championships, and she was voted for by fellow members of the British team. Ailey became the most decorated Scottish track and field athlete in history this March, following a 4x400 metre silver at the European Athletics Indoor Championships in Belgrade, and completed her Grand Slam set of Commonwealth, European and World Championships medals last year in Rio when she added Olympic 4x4 bronze to the collection. Nathaniel Mitchell-Blake, he's the British champion and ranked inside the world's top 10 over 200 metres this year. Nathaniel is the second British athlete to break the sub-10 and sub-20 barrier. Dina Asher-Smith. Dina is the British record holder in the 60, 100 and 200 metres. At the World Championships in 2015, she finished fifth in the 200 metres. She is the reigning European 200 metre champion and won Olympic bronze medal in a British record as part of the women's 4x100 Rio team in Rio. And finally, we have Martin Rooney, who's the reigning European 400 metre champion, but I take most pleasure in being able to say he's now also an Olympic medalist. Thanks, mate. <laughs> so let's open the questions to the floor. Who'd like to start? No one? Okay, Anyone? Going, yeah. We're all done. <laughs> <laughs> We're all done. We're all done. Jamie, um, Neil, even if you is running uh, his last track championship, can you put into context what he's achieved and, and your sort of memories of what he's done over the last few years? How long have we got? <laughs> uh, can I put into context? Um, I, you, know, you know Mo as, as well as I do, and, and thank you all for, for being here, for the, the huge commitment, the time, the energy, the enthusiasm that, that you guys all put into to supporting uh, athletics generally and, and uh, uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, in particular. It, it's, Im it's impossible to summarise all these things. I've, I've um, worked with, supported, seen a young boy, a young prankish boy who uh, still interestingly calls himself Mad Mo. Um, and um, to see someone develop from a kid who just loved sport, loved life, uh, really enjoyed himself in a, in a relaxed way to become a focused, um, determined, competitive being. Um, to, have, to have been part of that journey is a, a massive pleasure to have seen him develop both as a person and as a, as a competitor. I don't think you can make comparisons, I don't think you can really describe it, but I think what you'll see again here in this championships is somebody who hasn't lost that passion, somebody who still combines uh, having fun in life, being completely chilled, messing around with his kids, with his family, with his friends, with his sporting colleagues, and yet with the focused determination to come and kill himself for this thing that means so much to him, which is winning. And I think it's about winning for Mo Farah. Yeah, can I ask, um, you know, you talk about the competitiveness. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, can I ask, um, uh, is it a concern that his coach, given how, how important he is to, to Mo in terms of guiding and mentoring, is it a concern that he's not going to be here uh, in terms of Mo delivering uh, on the day? Do you know why he's not here? And the third part of the question, if you don't mind, did it concern you in your position when you read the leaked report, uh, you signed the report and you sent the Texas Medical Review? Uh, I'll, I'll try and answer in the best way that I can. Uh, Mo Farah, if he was here alone, the result would be the same. The thing that is so special about Mo Farah is he doesn't need any of us. He can do it himself 
but he enjoys the fact that other people support him, want to work with him, enjoy working with him, give him direction. And he does take on board what everybody says, but in the end, he makes the decisions. And I think that's, again, one of the things that makes him a special, multiple, global champion. So um, we never have any concerns who's here and who isn't here. And, and again, I think the, um, an indication of a great team is that nobody is indispensable. And we all play our roles at different stages, um, but nobody thinks they're so important, and Mo doesn't rely on any of us. Um, so not concerned because uh, we just mix and match as a team, and we know that Mo's going to do it. Um, I, I, not avoiding the question, but I think it is uh, important. I think the only person who can answer why he's not here is Alberto. Um, and uh, did it concern me, the leaked report? It concerns me that things get leaked. It concerns me that things can be and are written in a way um, that can make things appear uh, bad. Um, it didn't concern me having known, spoken to, questioned, looked in the eye, all of those things. Um, there was nothing in the leaked report that was a surprise or a shock to me personally. Um, I'm not yet from the keeper. Could you make a comparison between the, the shape of the uh, British team now comparing in uh, 2012? That's a good question. I, I think um, in the team now, which I'm so pleased about, all, all of these guys here, um, people again who've been and done it before, uh, again, Martin, um, medals and, and so on that way a and an enormous number of people who are very very close so um, when, when everybody does their analysis and their statistics <coughs> and when we look at that group of people for this championship who we believe have the capacity to be in the top eight and make finals we think there's a very large number of people in that group that excites us about a home world championships, that excites us about the potential for um, many of those people stepping up for this championship, and it possibly even more so excites us about the future in terms of what can, can be achieved. And I think the difference, um, obviously, between the two championships, there's probably many, but that that sits in my mind were there probably weren't as many people in that group in 2012 but there were obviously um, perhaps more people who were slightly more established and or that the rest of the world would look and think that they were going to win medals. Do we have some questions for the athletes? Yeah, could I ask uh, Dina, um, there's always going to be very sort of poignant championships for yourself, given that you were here on Super Saturday as a, as a kit carrier. I know you've mm. told the story a million times, but would you mind just... Uh, the and how that's going to make you feel when you walk out on the track. Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, I was fortunate enough to be a kit carrier on Super Saturday in 2012. Um, I remember I'd just done the World Junior Championships in Barcelona, so I would have been about, I would have been 16. So obviously I wasn't running the times, so I wasn't even looking to be at the Olympics, but I just thought, oh, okay, I can volunteer here and um, I can kind of do something there. And I was, yeah, we were fortunate enough to get given the Super Saturday as a slot, which obviously we didn't know was gonna end up being Super Saturday. I remember being kind of disappointed that we weren't gonna see Usain Bolt, but obviously when we got there, <laughs> and then we realized that we were witnessing probably one of the greatest nights in British history, British sporting history, um, we felt incredibly lucky. Like it's one of those things that I have to say, if you were in, I mean, most of you are probably in the stadium that evening, <coughs> but um, it, to describe the atmosphere that night, um, to somebody who wasn't there is incredibly difficult. I think the closest word to that is probably euphoric, but um, at the same time, yeah, it's hard to describe if you weren't there. So that um, and being able to kind of have the, have the opportunity to go and perform in the same stadium, in the same city this year, in a couple of days, is going to be so unforgettable for me. So it's going to be so special, and I'm just so grateful to be able to be in this position.
actually here? Yeah, I think. Oh yeah, definitely. I think the past, obviously, the past five years for me has been a bit of a whirlwind. I like to describe it because obviously I've gone from somebody who was just about to scrape into like junior finals, just about make junior teams, to suddenly kind of making senior teams, making World Olympic finals, and now being kind of at a home champs and on <laughs> posters, which is kind of embarrassing still. But <laughs> but um, yeah, there was times um, earlier in the year when it was kind of in doubt, or maybe I wasn't quite sure if I was going to be here, how quickly I was going to be running, what kind of shape I was going to be, if I was going to be still in pain, etc., etc. And um, I'm really, really happy with how I've recovered from this kind of very um, <laughs> interesting injury that happened earlier this year. But um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to get out there and go and hopefully do everybody proud. Martin, do you want to share some of your memories from 2012? I swear. <laughs> <laughs> um, 2012 was uh, an amazing experience for everyone. I think Ailey summed it up in our, in our team captain speech, probably best if she speaks about it. But I bricked it in 2012, so I'm kind of excited <laughs> to go back to, to compete in front of a home crowd and actually being ready to embrace it, ready to... I know what's coming. It's going to be a wall of noise. Uh, I'm trying to get it around to as many young athletes in the team like you have to accept that it's going to happen. You have to accept that it's going to be intimidating, but use it. Um, so I'm just excited to get back out of there and try and build upon it. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of the athletes um, going out and training, or you're still training with the wrong age. Do you mm-hmm. think it's been an advantage for you or disadvantage training for you? Um, it's certainly been an advantage for me, not just as an athlete, but just as a person, because I think everybody does, they kind of see us as these kind of machines, which we are, we like to think of ourselves as machines, that go and just run these fast times, but you've got to, kind of remember that if you want to be able to perform well the rest of your life you have to be kind of happy so I'm there with my friends I'm there with my mum and dad I'm obviously I'm training with a coach that I've known since I was like eight years old who I know would just never ever kind of well yeah he's 100% behind me and he's like a dad to me so I love that at the same time um, I'm able to go to uni which I've obviously just finished this year so for me staying in Bromley and kind of being there is definitely well yeah it's definitely kind of the best thing for me as a person in the whole. Uh, I think Tony's probably got his own reasons for saying what he said. Um, when I look at the number of coaches coaching you know, athletes here, you look at Brian, who's Ailey's coach, Malcolm, who was Ailey's coach before that, John Blackie, who's uh, uh, Dina's coach, um, coaches who Martin's worked with before, and if you look at the majority of people in the team, or many of the people in the team, you'll see just as many British coaches as you, you will el- elsewhere. We're really proud of the fact that we've, um, we've uh, appointed someone to a full-time position that's called High Performance Coach Development Manager. We're appointing a talent director. We've appointed two people on, on uh, into what we call pathway manager positions. So it takes a little bit of time to uh, build systems. We have a longer term strategy. We're massively supported by the British Athletics Board. We have, um, we've worked very hard at building improved and better relationships with the home nations. And that's, so actually, accidentally, we've moved probably faster than we have before, I say accidentally in terms of the timing of Tony's comments, and um, we're about to really embark on something that I think over the next 4, 8, 12, 20 years, people will really see this determined investment in British coaching. That's how it feels to me. Okay. <laughs> after, after your team I was going to ask you how that went and, and how it was received, but also now you've got the tracksuit on, does this feel like maybe one of the, the, the proudest moments of what's already been established as a, as, a, as a glittering career? And on top of that, the fact that so many Scots in the team, does that add to your sense of pride? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think this, the special thing about the team captain this year was the fact that it was voted for by the other members of the team. So I think that, you know, it was it was such a huge honour anyway, but to know that like your teammates have voted for you and chosen for you, I think it made it extra special for me. So yeah, a huge, huge honour for me and, and one that I'll you know I'll look back on the years to come and be very proud of. Um, and obviously 
very proud of all the Scots that have made the team. I think that's, you know, it just shows how far we've come as well. I think my first World Championships back in 2009, I think there was maybe two of us, uh, me and Lee McConnell. So to, to have, I think it's 16 maybe now is the final number, is, is just incredible. And again, not just here to, as our first champs, as well-established athletes there. Athletes are going to be looking to make finals, you know, try and get on the podium. So, yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm hugely proud of that, and I just, you know, my speech, I think, I think it went well. I mean, I just drew on the fact that we were very lucky in this situation that we've got a home World Championships, and I'm particularly lucky that I got to go to a home Olympic Games, then a home Commonwealth Games, and now I'm getting a home World Championship. So it's just really, you know, that importance of drawing on a home support and, you know, just really thriving on the fact that we're, we're back at the Olympic Stadium. I'm getting a second chance to go out there and, and compete, and, and yeah, it's just going to be such an amazing atmosphere out there. I think it speaks for itself and you know uh, whoever you speak to has has a, a view as to why that is how that is you know uh, I speak to people in the Scottish Institute of Sport and they think it's you know it's something to do with what they've done and Scottish athletics and something to do with what they've done and and British athletics and something to do with what they've done and the guy on the corner the street who, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, it, it's um, whatever the combination of circumstances, it's absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, a Ailey, probably slightly, she's very modest and she does herself a disservice. You know, her speech was incredible. The number of athletes, whether they were Scottish, you know, uh, or, or, or wherever they lived or training or what have you, walked out of that room feeling... Um, hugely proud and, and really motivated and, and the passion and, and, and real feeling that, that Ailey naturally put into it was, was great. Um, and, and I think the Scottish athletes um, are, are a massive contribution to, to, to the team. Um, there's something special evolving there and we embrace it and we're trying to understand whether there's anything we can particularly learn from it. Uh, and we'll push on that until we, you know, we kind of work it out. Hey, um, I'm a bit disappointed you didn't use my daily bread suggestion. <laughs> um, what, can you just give us a little flavour of what you actually said, what, what words you used, and, and whether that was um, a passionate moment for you, whether you felt nervous? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I was definitely nervous for it, but it was something that I, I took very seriously. You know, I worked on it, you know, throughout the. As soon as I kind of was told that I was going to be team captain, that was the first thing that I really thought about, and, and even chatted with the athletes about kind of what they were thinking about going into the into the champ. So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of drew on two big experiences that were completely different. I drew on my experience from London 2012, which wasn't a, a brilliant experience. You know, it was quite an overwhelming one, and I didn't perform very well. And then compared that to to one of the best experiences that I have, which was Glasgow 2014, and being able to do a lap of honour in front of a home crowd, and and yeah, just kind of con contrasted the two and but just showed the importance of really using a home crowd and not letting it overwhelm you and kind of taking that forward. And, and yeah, again, it was just it was very honest. And I think, you know, it was just nice for people to hear that it's not always plain sailing, it's not always a smooth journey, but, you know, you learn from it and you move forward and, and, and hopefully yeah, you get better memories after that. Nicola, can I just ask you your thoughts on Andre Grass being out of It's disheartening. Uh, he's a stellar athlete. Um, accomplishing great things at such a young age and um, for the 200 metres and for the 100 metres it's upsetting. But when you, you, know, when you see that happen, you don't want another athlete to be injured clearly, but does it open up even more opportunities for the Um For everybody in a sense, but it's eight lanes, there's a load of people here vying for those eight spots, so uh, you can't pay too much attention to one individual. You have to stay focused on your task at hand. Neil, uh, can I pick on something that, that you said to Matt earlier? You said you didn't have any concerns. Uh, you, you have an unspoken question, look people in the eye <coughs> about the whole new side thing. Does that mean you've, you've looked Alberto in the eye, you've looked Mo in the eye? And secondly, what do you say to those people that say there's USADA, there's Jamaid, and there's this latest fancy bears thing, and have and sort of have worries or concerns about Mo? Um, yeah. I'm of course, you, you, you look people in the eye, uh, and we, we all do it, and you have to work out and ask the question, do, do, I, do I believe, is there anything that suggests otherwise? And there's nothing at all that suggests otherwise to me. I understand that if you read information and if you talk to people, uh, it, 
it's very easy for people to fall into the trap of assuming fault, blame, looking negatively, building this picture that it seems to be a natural human trait that we do, that we make something into something else, we add two and two and get whatever. So I understand that, I don't, I therefore don't misunderstand <coughs> people who feel differently, I don't. And you know him better than most, because you've been with him for how many years? I've been with Mo since he was 15, um, and I've, I've known Alberto since, well, since Mo, you know, in effect, moved over there. I, was, I knew him before that, but not very well. Um, yeah, and you, you get to know people in this, this world. You know, you spend time with people. That doesn't concern you now when you follow on, but, you know, it's the New York Times, Jeffrey Brown was in some letter by you, so it's, it's more than just seeing things, it's... The situation appears to be escalating, and the seems to be moving towards some kind of conclusion. I, I, again, I'd rather talk, and I'd rather we were talking to the athletes and about these championships. So if I'd say for, for the last time, um, when you read things, the way they're written, the way people talk about it, people talk as though they have facts, I, I'm not sure that... Um, the facts are always those that are printed or spoken. Questions for the athletes? Sorry, Neil, what, what sort of shape is Bowie's in compared to previous championships? We saw him on him, but I think last year um, you were very, very bullish about his chances before. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's evolved over time, as you all know, and, you know, he's He's a little bit older and things are a little bit different and so on. What, um, I'm just trying to say it efficiently. At every year, certain things happen where it gets to a point where suddenly Mo Farah knows that he's ready. Last year, it was the Moor Anniversary Games. 5K, suddenly he was like, we're ready. This year, it was probably about 12 days ago, and he did something in training without killing himself that confirmed to him and to the rest of us, you're ready. And he then just takes his shoes off and says, that's it, job done. So you'll see something pretty special. Is that in, sorry, was that in form of life? Yeah. Track session? Yeah. Can I? Can you give more details? <laughs> no. I'd rather not. I, I, I've said before, keep, keep, you know, Mo needs to run 120 miles a week. He needs uh, a block of time at altitude. He needs to do certain key sessions, and he needs to be happy. That that block finished about 10 days ago, and it was like, job done. I'm going to flash back to, to Glasgow 2015. Did you warm up in a Celtic top nine chance? That was in uh, yeah the group Diamond. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> Are you pleased with progression through the championship? <laughs> 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 it didn't go too well, but uh, I'm more of a Palace fan, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, <laughs> more seriously, um, the whole kind of Glasgow 2014 thing, is there anything you can draw on from, from that uh, event coming into, into this one in comparison to the whole championships? Um, Glasgow was one of the best events I've ever been to. The, the people of Scotland put on a great event. Um, the crowd were incredible, they were supportive of everyone. It wasn't just Scottish athletes, they got behind everyone. Um, for me personally, I, I came fourth behind two, world, two Olympic medalists and now the world record holder, so it was a tough event for me, but it was an amazing experience. I think um, it's something I remember fondly, and I think uh, athletes who went there, they're going to be maybe not the same preparation as London, it, it wasn't, but well, it's obviously loud for Ailey, it was ridiculous, but, <laughs> but it, London's going to be bigger again, so it's a great stepping stone for some athletes, and hopefully, uh, like, I just want to say how positive. I, I, I know we were talking about shape of the team earlier. Uh, I was on the team in 2005, which was miserable. <laughs> um, I, like, as, the, as I've been on teams like, over the years, like, you see how the, the positivity is growing towards, not just from positivity of their own efforts, it's towards other people in the team. People want other people to do well. Like, for this team right now, it's, like, it's exciting to be part of. I'm 30 years old, so I'm like, nearly on the way out soon, but like, <laughs> just to see these young guys coming through, they want each other to do well. People like Nathaniel has come across, uh, he's racing in the States, but he brings that team ethos from LSU to, 
it's in a four by one and, and it, it's infectious. So like, I'm just really happy to be part of this and excited for the next couple of weeks. And Neth Neil, someone that is coming through, do you want to share how you're feeling now for your first World Championships? First World Championships and it's at home, you know. Uh, I know I'm based in the States, but I was born in East London. And the uh, funny story is the warm track in Newham is across the street from where I was, where I was born, like literally two minute walk. So um, it's nostalgic in that sense. But um, as Ailey and uh, Martin said, you can't really premeditate the feeling that you're going to get from a home championship. So um, I'm just really looking forward to embracing it as a... Uh, AD said in the team meeting and using the energy from the crowd to spur me on and spur the team onto something special because we have an advantage. Um, in football, when you have a home game, you play better at home than you do away. So hopefully we can draw the energy from the crowd with the help of you guys writing some beautiful things about us and um, we will do well. Nice. <laughs> nice. Neville, before the, um, the Diamond League, then when was the last time you came back to East London and how different does it look? from when you were a kid? Uh, so I moved away in 2007. I came back 2008. had a return ticket so I can come straight back. <laughs> and then uh, after that, it was uh, only for meets, only for meets. So I came back for World Youth 2011 and I was down for maybe three days before I flew off to, to France. And then 2013 for European Juniors and I was down, for, Dean on that team as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I was down for maybe four days and flew off to Italy. So I never really had a chance to take it in and look around. It was always come back, I get this big old suitcase I'm excited about, show my whole family, and then um, jetting off. So I'd say last year really uh, was the first time I got to come back and look around and be like, wow, you know. And a lot's changed because 2012 had happened and a lot of infrastructure was built in East London and it's looking beautiful. I think, uh, uh, as you know, I, I generally don't, I don't do medal targets and ranges and so on that way, but we have to have, uh, uh, quite rightly, an arrangement with UK Sport, who are main funders through National Lottery and Exchequer and so on. Um, it, uh, without doubt, it's, on, it's doable. I'm, I'm certainly not sitting here, you know, kind of thinking otherwise. But, um, again, to remind us all, um, the stats and the trend in... Uh, world Championships after Olympic and Paralympic years internationally tend to produce a, a very challenging year, but that's challenging for everyone. Um, but the, um, the standards tend to dip uh, to a degree. There are more challenges with injury, illness, motivation, and so on that way. And the home nation um, rarely does as well in a post-Olympic or Paralympic year as they did in uh, the Olympics or the Paralympics. At the para-athletics, as you saw, we bucked the trend, kicked it in the backside. Um, and that was absolutely brilliant. And Paula Dunn and, and her team and all of those athletes and coaches, absolutely brilliant. And that's fantastic, but that's put a little bit more pressure on, on us because uh, it's like, are we going to be able to buck the trend as well? It's a massive task. Um, the final preparations are taking place now that, that these guys are doing. Um, some of the decisions that are made at this point make a difference. They're critical. Whether you train, whether you don't, whether you chill, whether you don't, how well you deal with chilling, how well you deal with home advantage, which as Ailey said in, in 2012 for her actually became perhaps a disadvantage. Um, so you, these guys have to deal with all of that, but the, the simple answer is if we deal with it well, and you get a little bit of luck that everybody needs, whoever you are, then I think we meet the medal target. If we don't deal with it well, and we don't get a bit of a luck, we might get a kick in the backside. Um, that's what it feels like. But I don't see any reason why we can't look at it positively. Uh, can I ask about your own thoughts going into the championship, you know, in terms of your form, obviously you had that great run in, um, in Monaco, and how surprised were you with that, and how much have you come on since then, and how did you get that forward? Um, I'm quite excited for these championships. Obviously, as um, Neil has said, this is kind of like the post-Olympic year, so you always expect there to be like a bit of a dip 
kind of obviously me breaking my foot adds to that. <laughs> but um, yeah, around the world is kind of like the same thing. So um, I'm really, really excited for these championships. I was, was really, really happy to run a 22.8 in Monaco. Um, it wasn't necessarily a surprise, but um, hopefully I can go faster because I was out there. I suffered with a bit of food poisoning. So <laughs> that race was quite interesting for me. But um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to get on track and stop, um, get running. The holding camp has been really positive for me. Question for Ailey. Um, there's always a few athletes every year that throw up surprises, and obviously this year is a particularly youthful developing team. Who um, do you think are some of the athletes that we should have been looking out for? Oh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's 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 a big squad and, and, and we've got a lot. I mean I think for me there's um we do have our ones obviously that you're kind of expecting things from, but I think um I think across the board I think we've got a lot of great sprinters coming through. Um personal note, I think Chris O'Hare might have a really good year. You know, he's just shown great confidence, especially, you know, picking up Diamond League wins, you know, he's shown you can go out there and, and not be intimidated. So you know, he'd be one that I think will go out there and do well. But it's very difficult to say because, like I say, it's going to be who's going to go out there and really thrive from this home atmosphere. And I think a lot of folk come out and surprise us. And I think, from like, like I've said before, I think the main thing is to really look across the whole team. You know, not so much at the medals, but look at how many people really kind of step up, how many people get into finals that you might not have expected it, how many people run PBs, you know, run their best times there. You know, because that's so important because athletics is a very difficult sport to win medals in. You know. Like I think I said in my speech, virtually every country can do athletics, so it's very difficult. And you know, to judge us on medals, it's you know, it's it's very harsh for us. You know, it's, but I think if you look at the bigger, the bigger picture, you know, I think we're going to have a really successful games, and I think we're going to see, you know, some new new blood coming through and, and people to look out for in the future. Expanding more on that, and not just from a British perspective, anybody on the table really. How much is this championship like athletics hitting the reset button post? Usain Bolt and Mo Farah really, especially on the track, I know Mo in front of the marathon, but it really leaves a gap for someone to go. <coughs> well, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think it does. I think you're obviously you're, you're kind of saying goodbye to, to two big legends, but what you've got to remember is, is Bolt and, and Mo Farah don't actually compete that much throughout the year. You know, so I think, yes, probably at the championships you, 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 you'll, you'll see that gap, but I think whenever a champ starts, Everyone just embraces it and, and just gets behind good athletics, regardless of who's there. You know, you're going to just be there, you know, just enjoying it all. And I think, you know, I don't think there's going to be that big a gap that people kind of expect because, like I say, they don't compete a lot of time in the Diamond Leagues and all those events, and they're very well, you know, represented and watched. Um, but I mean, obviously, you've got people like Wade Van Niekerk coming through, who's, who's smashing records. So, yeah, I think it's it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Nathaniel, you spoke about this earlier and how you want to be the one. To do your own thing. Oh, uh, yeah, I tapped <laughs> out. I used my good answers back at the hotel. But, um, yeah, the sport is, is facing the change of the guards that we've all seen. But um, I believe we get too caught up on the big, you know, the Mo Farahs or the Usain Bolt. We have to understand that everybody wants to create their own legacy, you know. I often get asked, um, am I going to be the next Usain Bolt? I want to be Nathan and Mitchell Blake, you know. Whatever I achieve in my future endeavours as far as the track athlete on and off is concerned, um, I want to build my own legacy. And I believe every athlete should be recognised in their own right going forward, you know. It's a beautiful sport. As Eddie said, it can be done all across the world and it's not really hard to get into. You just can run barefoot, can't you? But um, there's some great talents coming to and fro and there'll be people after our generation and after Bolt, after myself, you know, 50 years down the line, you know. It's people always evolving. Okay, and that's, uh, that's us done. We've got to go now, unfortunately. So thank you very much for your time. And finally, it's here.